In this video, I will teach you how to use Docker. You will dive right into coding and learn how to create images, use repositories to distribute them, run containers on a server, analyze them, roll out updates to your containers, and finally clean up all your mess. This is the ultimate Docker tutorial. Let's get started. Welcome to the fifth lesson of Docker from Zero to Infinity series. My name is Raghav. Before we begin, I highly recommend you watch my video about Docker's architecture, where I explain the basic workflow and key components. All code and commands discussed in this video are also available on my GitHub repository. Just look for the link in the description. You only truly learn by doing. So I want you to do this exercise with me as you watch the video. Download the application code from GitHub and follow along. The very first step in the Docker workflow is to take your application and create an image. I have written a basic Hello World REST API in Python for this demo. But you don't need to know Python for this lesson. Docker can work with any programming language. You just need to supply the right commands to build and run your application. Beautiful, isn't it? I am inside my project directory. App.py is my main application code. As you can see, it's a dead simple Flask app that returns a hello world string when I call the API. Requirements.txt contains the dependencies of the app. Now let me run this application locally once. And when I make a curl request to it, I receive a response and the app also logs this request. To create an image for the app, we need to create a Docker file inside our project directory. There are specific instructions you write in the Docker file to tell Docker what to do. The documentation is the best place to know about all the possible instructions. Let's create the Docker file. Because I have a Python application, to make my life easy, I can use the Python base image. A base image is the first layer of your Docker image. It can either be scratch, which means an empty image, or some purpose-built image that makes setting up your application much easier. For example, Linux distros such as Ubuntu and Alpine can be used as base images. They come packed with dependencies, so you don't have to download everything. A Python base image already comes packed with OS level support and the Python interpreter plus dependencies. This way, I don't have to worry about installing Python before setting up my application inside the image. If you'd like to understand scratch base images, I made a separate video to explain that. Now I'll use workdir to create and set the main working directory inside which the rest of my commands will execute. Next, we need to install all dependencies of our app inside the image. To do that, I'll first copy my requirements.txt inside the image. Then I'll run pip install on it. The copy instruction copies files and folders from your computer to the image. Run helps you execute shell commands while your image is being built. I'd also like to copy my code file into the image. Since this is a simple app, just copying the app.py works. For larger projects with multiple files and folders, you can use wildcards with the copy instruction. Let's set a dummy environment variable using env. This is not needed by the app, but it will be useful later. Finally, I want to specify how my app will run when I start the container. CMD is used to specify what command should run by default when you start a container from the image. So this instruction starts our application automatically when we start our container. Awesome. The next step is to build the image using our Docker file. Use the docker build command to do this. We use hyphen t to specify the name and tag for our image. A tag can be used to create different versions of the same image. The default tag in docker is latest. Finally, a dot specifies that build can use the docker file 
in the current working directory to build the image. This is for convenience. If your Docker file is in some other directory, you can obviously specify the exact path. All right, let's run it. As you can see, a couple of things are happening. As a first step, Docker is downloading the Python 3.12 base image from Docker Hub. This takes some time because some base images are really large. I'm talking gigabytes. Then all other commands were also executed as specified in the Docker file. Let's check if our image got created. There it is. Every image on your system has a unique ID. Also, notice that our image is 1 GB in size. Now that our image is ready, let's push it to a repository so we can distribute it to other machines. By default, Docker connects to Docker Hub, which is a repository operated by Docker itself. I'm going to stick to it for the demo, but you might be using a different repository like AWS ECR, JFrog, etc. Okay, so first up, if you haven't already, create an account on Docker Hub. An account is not mandatory if you just want to pull the images, but here I want to push my images to my repository. In your account, create a new repository. In my case, I'll create a public repo because this is just a sample app. But unless you're developing in the open, you will probably be using private repositories a lot more. And if you are, private repos require client authentication in order to push pull images. Check the documentation of your repository provider to make sure you're authenticated. Good. This repo will hold all images I create for my Hello app. Back to terminal, I now need to authenticate my computer with Docker Hub so I can push my images to my repos. Let's do that. Now, Notice that if I'd like to push my images to my repo, it has to reside inside my namespace. So I must push my image as duaragave slash hello app. So I should tag my image like this. Here, I just created a copy of my Hello app image, but with a different name. Now, I can push this image directly. The docker push command uploads an image on your host machine to a registry. By default, it pushes to docker hub, which is what I want. And now if I go back to my repository, I can see my image is listed. A lot of information is available when you click on a specific image tag. Every time you add a new command in your Docker file, it creates a new layer in your image. And here, I can see all the layers. Notice that my commands are at the end, but I didn't write these previous commands. Can you comment and tell me where they are coming from? It was fun building the image. Now, let's run the container. All right, now I'm inside an Ubuntu server where I'll run my Hello App container. I just chose Ubuntu out of preference, but you could do this entire activity on any other platform of your choice. Windows, Mac OS, even your Abacus. That's the beauty of Docker. The first thing I need to do is pull the image on my system. Since my image is in a public repository, any machine in the world can pull it. Even you can pull it right now. But if my image were in a private repository, then my server would need authentication and authorization to pull this image. For now, let's go ahead and pull. Okay, I have the image. To run a container for my image, we use the docker run command. Recall that our application binds to TCP port 5000 to serve requests. But by default, when you run a container, Docker doesn't expose any open ports outside the container. You need to use hyphen P option to map a container port to a port on the host machine. So with this command, I'll run my container and whatever is running on TCP port 5000 inside the container will also be exposed to TCP port 8080 on the Ubuntu server. I can now see some output from my Flask app, 
This means my container is running. The docker ps command lists all running containers on your system. Let's try to make a request. Works like a charm. But right now, I'm running the container in my current terminal session. If I close my terminal or press Ctrl C, my container exits. The detach option lets you run the container in the background. So let's use that. Cool. And I can use Docker PS to verify that my container is indeed running. Awesome. Now that we have a running container, there are a lot of fun things we can do to analyze it. Let's start with inspect. Docker inspect gives us a lot of low level information about Docker objects, especially containers. Inspect produces a lot of output. So a little trick I like to use is to stream all its output to Vim. Pretty neat, huh? You can see lots of metadata, what storage volumes are attached to the container, what kind of network it is on, etc. You can even check the environment variable supplied. Recall that I had set app underscore env equals dev in my Docker file. And it is reflecting here. This is also a potential security risk though. If you supply sensitive credentials to your app via environment variables, an attacker who has access to your machine could also run inspect to expose them. The logs command displays logs produced by your container. By default, the container logs show everything logged by the application on STD out and STD ERR streams. I can use hyphen F to stream new logs. There. I made a curl request and my app produced a new log about it. Finally, if you would like to go inside the container, you can use exec. Exec obviously stands for execute. Docker exec can generally be used to run any command inside a running container. So I could even run ls to list files and directories. The magic happens when you run the command bash inside the container in interactive mode. This essentially gives you shell access inside the running container and then you can explore around. When you feel like exiting the container, you can simply exit the current shell session. And that's it. Inspect, logs, and exec are some of the most helpful and powerful commands in Docker CLI. It will be worth your while to master them. What happens when I need to push new changes to my app? Let's say I'd like to add a new route to my API. slash ping that returns a pong. In order for this update to reflect on my running containers, I need to do a couple of things. First, I need to create a new image which contains my latest code. To eliminate the confusion, I'll remove the existing image which we call latest. Now, I could tag my new image as latest once again, but since we are going to be iterating over the app often, 
it makes a lot of sense to start assigning versions to the images. So for this image, my tag will be 0.1.0. Let's build. And now we have a new image with a specific version. Let's push this image tag to the repository. Yep, the new tag is now present in my repo. Now, all servers running my app can pull the new container by specifying the exact tag. This way, they receive the latest updates. So let's run the new container. Note that I'm using a different host port to map to because 8080 is still occupied by the previous container, the original one. Since this new image isn't already present locally, Docker automatically pulls it from my repository and starts running it. Let's try the new API out. It works. And finally, when it's time to retire your container, you can just use Docker stop. This command is used to gracefully stop a running container. It sends a sig term signal to the main process of the container. In our case, the hello application. You can also use Docker kill, which kills the running container immediately without any grace period by sending a sig kill signal. Note that a stopped or killed container is still visible in Docker. So if you want to permanently get rid of it, just use RM. Fun fact, you can also revive a stopped container. Just use docker start. Lastly, to delete an image you no longer want to keep, run docker rmi. Ooh, that was a lot. We learned the complete workflow of Docker. How to create an image for our application, working with repositories, running containers on different systems, pushing updates to the application, and finally retiring old containers. I'm sure you realize that there is a lot of manual labor involved in this entire lifecycle. Running and managing thousands of containers across hundreds of servers, different operating systems, data centers, geographical regions, and cloud providers is not a piece of cake. That is why in the next video, I will teach you how containers are operated at a very large scale using container orchestration. You will learn what is Kubernetes, what is Docker Compose, and how do these technologies work with Docker. For now, just focus on practicing the skills you have learned in today's lesson. Here's a little question for you. When you run your applications inside containers, they consume some resources like CPU, memory, and storage. Sometimes, a container may not get enough resources because of which your app performs poorly or crashes altogether. How would you monitor your Docker containers to ensure that they are always healthy? Think about it. How do you monitor traditional applications? Can those methods be applied here? Or do we require more modern methods? Let's discuss in the comments. Keep leveling up your DevOps skills with me. If you're new here, subscribe to my channel now. If you find my content valuable, press a like and show me your support. I'll see you in the next video.